so all of you is immediately recorded. Uh, so thank you all so much for being here on this Tuesday afternoon, night, morning, wherever you are. My name is Jenna Malidi. I am an education advocacy intern with the Media Education Lab, and this is the second installment of our summer webinar series. This is Media Literacy, Moral Panic, and Video Games, Learning Through Play with Iglika Ivanova. This webinar will run for one hour. It is recorded. There will be a Q&A portion at the end, so please keep yourselves muted until then, but feel free to turn on your camera or just leave any questions or comments in the chat, uh, and I'll read them out loud at the end. Now, I am very happy to introduce Iglika Ivanova as our speaker today. Uh, Iglika is a PhD candidate in media policy in EU law and a lecturer at the University of Sofia in Bulgaria. In 2018, she defended her master's thesis on the role of video games in the development of media literacy in the European studies major. In 2019, she joined the Media Literacy Coalition in Bulgaria and was elected to the Board of Trustees. She was recently appointed as a state expert in the Directorate of International Cooperation, European Programs and Regional Activities of the Ministry of Culture in Bulgaria. She is a Media Ed Forum 2023 and 2024 co-chair and Media Education Lab affiliate member since 2022. We are very lucky that she is taking the time to speak with us today. So please give a warm welcome to Iglika. Oh, wow. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Jenna. And thank you to the lab for uh, the opportunity. I, I adore these webinars and these meetings, um, all the clubs uh, and all the opportunities to learn from you because this is how I see all these interactions. Uh, I see my interactions with students the same way. It's an uh, endless learning curve. Uh, it is very enriching. Um, as I promised, I will start with a few disclaimers because I find this um, uh, important. Probably one of the most important things is because of this topic that is very, I would say, controversial uh, for most of the people, no matter uh, the professional field and the experiences, uh, I, I acknowledge that. Um, and um, I have to admit that me myself is a passionate video gamer for many years. So um, after um, hundreds of hours uh, in different worlds and realms in different uh, platforms and form and uh, formats like um, always with preference on multiplayer games and always uh, uh, happy and enjoying to be part of communities around video games this is uh, giving me a specific um, perspective I have to acknowledge that because this is uh, the, especially especially framing these questions from the perspective of education and how you can utilize video games and gaming in your teaching. It it needs to accept a few things that are making it very challenging. It is not only a question about desire and curiosity and being open-minded to introduce new methodologies in the classroom, but it is about access. It is about uh, having for yourself the time um, to, to play video games, to experience video games. Um, that is making it uh, difficult. And you will see through the examples and um, uh, from a recent article that I shared with, um, with we will share with all of you regarding um, video games in education. Um, I am a um, proponent and advocate of using commercial video games. Uh, of course, serious educational video games as well. And I provide a few examples at the end. But at the same time, the whole question is about the culture of video games, the video game design, uh, the presence of video games, the immersion of video games, uh, all the experiences with all the good and all the bad things. And I was thinking that... Uh, uh, Presenting this topic from uh, uh, the angle of moral panic and techno panic is very relevant to the fact that we now experience that we are at the age of AI that is creating this same um, environment, uh, the same um, uh, contradictions in, in many peoples. Without further ado, I will share uh, the slides that you will have access to um, because uh, as you can see, oh, sorry, I have to go to my first slide. Well, here is the topic. Um, it is a very visual presentation. I have to tell you that it's uh, uh, probably too long one, but I enjoy it a lot. Uh, 
working on it <laughs> and I hope that you will do it uh, as well. What else I hope for and challenge you all is to look for cultural references in it, is to look for uh, probably some stereotypes, it's look to specific framing. Uh, I try to put a lot of symbols uh, and a lot of messages uh, in it. And this is very, again, um, I would say typical for video games, you know, about the uh, Easter eggs in many games that are, uh, it is not only in games, of course, it is in movies, in all Pixar's movies, you have this uh, Easter eggs to other Pixar movies, for example, but in video games, that is very strong and it is creating, um, I would say a lot, a lot of excitement and uh, uh, topics and videos and all this content creation uh, boost uh, around uh, this specific thing. Um, this is a, a phrase in Latin that I was raised with. Um, I was raised with, um, it, it, was, it was repeated a lot uh, from my mother. Uh, so um, to, with uh, quoting it here, non scholar sed vita distimus, I'm um, somehow dedicating my, this presentation and my approach to interactions with media to, to her. Uh, okay, so, uh, wise and bright-minded people told uh, some of the things that I'm trying to tell way better than me. And now I will share with you, uh, hopefully, yes, hopefully you will hear the sound. One of the things that's really fun with games is the whole idea of, of the playful mind and how can we make games that surprise you when we did the VCS, probably the biggest surprise that we had was how flexible it was. There's no question that when you have a very, very fundamental system, you know, I mean, it's like we were building games based on the rules of physics, you know, and, and, you know, and it was really simple. And yet it was extremely powerful in what you could do with it if you were creative, interested, and very, very smart. It used to be the case that the hardware engineers would put together cool technology and then throw it at the software guys and say, here, figure out what you can do with this. And the software guys, clever guys that they are, would not only learn how to use it, but they'd always try to drive it to its maximum limits. Where they wanted to take the system and, and make it bigger, make it better, and so they, they drove the basic design of it. And, and evolved it into a, a more powerful system. Back in the early days, the graphics were crude enough that we did our own graphics. The sounds were crude enough that we did our own sounds. So we became the designer, the director, the art director, the musician. And we even wrote the manual, designed the box. The game Pitfall evolved out of a lot of trial and error. We started with let me try to make a man running on the screen. Where might he be running? I'll make him run in a jungle. Why not? All you need is just the, the, the faintest kernel of an idea to start with. And you, you, you work on perfecting that little nugget until it feels fun, and you build upon that. The obligation in the early days of games was heavily on the user for willing suspension of disbelief. We really did ask users to use their imagination, and because that whole idea of computer graphics telling a story was so fresh, they were ready to do it. You'd think of all the things you could do in a perfect world, and then the tech would let you do the postage stamp in the middle of that landscape. But of course, the postage stamp keeps getting bigger as the years go by. My son was about six. He wanted a Nintendo system for Christmas. We plugged it in, and up came Super Mario Brothers for the very first time. And I was blown away by the phenomenal growth and development that games had undergone. And I thought if that 10 years wrought that much change in the capacity of this medium, this was going to be a medium of enormous expressive capacity, of enormous social capacity, that it was going to be the art form for the 21st century. Um. 
another disclaimer is that while I was working in 2017-18 on my master's thesis, I felt under the heavy influence of Professor Jenkins. And this is the, the last person you saw. But uh, it was, of course, not only him. During this, uh, this work that was very intense and immersive, I would say, like a video game itself, I also felt under the heavy influence of uh, Professor Renee Hobbs and Professor David uh, Buckingham, uh, a British scholar, and Professor James Paul G. Uh, so uh, I have to tell that because um, my uh, whole understanding, of course, I'm challenging myself uh, all these years, but it is to a huge extent um, shaped uh, by um, uh, how I experienced uh, the, the theory, uh, the views, the, the messages uh, of um, the scholars that I just uh, uh, mentioned. Um, why video games? Uh, video games, as you can see, and probably you know, they are part of uh, the broader framework of media literacy that is always expanding, of course, with new media and new technology. So it is part of the UNESCO Global Framework uh, for Media Information Literacy. They are very unique with that, uh, the, the, their futures that uh, combine simultaneously a cultural, a media, and a technological uh, dimensions, and developing digital skills and computer literacy, but also critical thinking and decision-making ability and participatory culture, uh, which is uh, absolutely, um, I would say, um, all, all, all the all the literature, all the scholarship of Professor Jenkins is uh, related to participatory culture. Uh, so it is a very complex component. That is something that I would say, um, to some extent, um, merges in itself all other literacies. Uh, I, as I mentioned, even even advertising literacy that is part of the MIL framework is there because um, the way video games are advertised and the way that in video games you can see some uh, references to uh, to trademarks, to very to pop culture and all that. Uh, Another important aspect of MIL that is very present in video games and um, all the environment that um, uh, that is created uh, around it uh, is the freedom of expression and the freedom of search for information. So um, I thought that uh, it is uh, important to mention that. I'm thinking about a lot about critical thinking. I'm thinking a lot about critical thinking because it is a buzzword together with um, uh, fake news and many uh, of the, um, you know, the, the the key, the key phrases of the past ten uh, years. But I don't think that media literacy is developing only critical thinking or exercising media literacy. We need only critical thinking. We have uh, all other ways of thinking about things. Uh, it is prejudgment, it is doubt, it is the logical thinking that is not exactly critical thinking and requires a lot of uh, knowledge and specific ways of thinking. It is critical ignoring. I very much like it. Was There was a Nielsen, uh, a Nielsen Media article about critical ignoring uh, because in the flood of so much information, it is just not possible to not uh, filter uh, at least something. Suspension of disbelief was mentioned. It was mentioned in the previous video. And uh, this is important because it is not only the video games that create this uh, realm that is immersing you and is uh, making it so easy to suspend your disbelief. Reading, reading or watching a movie is doing the same, especially the good ones. Uh, and of course, conspiracy thinking. Uh, I put into the context this presentation our uh, meeting a discussion today in the context of uh, all the events in the last two weeks. Uh, the, all the conspiracy theories that are emerging around events that lack enough information. This is a valid point. Yesterday there was um, uh, there was uh, a hearing uh, in the Congress. You know uh, that was uh, grilling at its best, um, and unfortunately, or probably it was important that. Um, in, in this case, the director of the Secret Service was, uh, I would say, uh, warned many times that with uh, such a huge 
um, uh, time without enough information is creating this vacuum that um, creates the fertile ground for conspiracy theories. Um, here are um, a few, probably given now I have a better idea of who is in the audience and probably too many of these things is not necessary even to mention. You will have them in the presentation later um, about the video games as experience. This is a very, I would uh, summarize to one sentence that uh, what is distinguishing video games than other forms of media is the, 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 the level of um, activation engagement of the gamers during their interaction with video games. It is just not possible to play video games in a passive way. Um, to add, we, uh, I think, need to uh, have in mind um, the level of mental engagement. So this is not uh, because, you know, video games are um, understood from many people and they are an entertainment industry as uh, something that you do in your leisure time. And probably that, that is uh, very um it, it is not it is not exhausting a lot your thinking and your concentration the truth is that um, difficult games and that is very true for commercial video games in specific genres uh, they are very engaging they have different di difficult stories to understand they have difficult mechanics to master so to be fluid in your in your gaming so they are very demanding the fact is that they are very, very demanding and from the very beginning we saw that in the video from the very beginning video games were thought and developed as something that you do with other people so uh, they are very community based per se uh, of course you have single player video games uh, that is only you and the environment and the story but now with uh, all these platforms uh, and all this, uh, including Steam or uh, platforms specific for video games, you can communicate and share your experience. You're absolutely all the time encouraged to share your experience, your knowledge, and this is the part of the participatory culture. Uh, with that, uh, because I um, will try to manage time uh, wisely, here you have uh, a short video presenting a specific game that was developed in Poland, this war of mine. Um, it was presented in the Museum of Modern Art. You have many games were, uh, but I will leave it for you to watch that a little bit later and we'll jump straight to the question of participatory culture and how uh, through playing video games and being interested in video games, you cannot uh, you, can, you can only be a fan. It's not necessary to play. You don't have time and everything, but you are a fan of video games. You're watching trailers. You are sleeping with uh, walkthroughs and something like that. So you're interested. How participatory culture is exercised around video games? It is because there are overlaps in, in, in um, this um, easiness to start playing video games. Uh, many of them are free to play, you know, it's not only expensive video games demanding on your PC system or your consoles and everything. So it is about low barriers uh, for artistic expression and civic engagement, uh, developing new skills um, and creating this sense to all the people uh, in the community space and the affinity space and in the game that they are contributing they're doing their contributions, especially in multiplayer video games like uh, World of Warcraft, for example, or League of Legends, you, um, you master a specific role uh, and you develop a specific character that is different than those of the other players that you play with. And that is your contribution is uh, equally important with all the other players. Um, uh, civic implications of participatory culture are profound. They are studied a lot, and you can uh, he read it in the Professor Jenkins' uh, books and articles. He, uh, two uh, more names here uh, Kurt Square and James Bolgi. They are both professors, and they are both fascinated by the, uh, by the potential of uh, video games for enriching young minds and developing uh, and, and to be utilized for civic education. In the case with uh, Kurt Square, Squire, um, he experimented a lot with strategy games like Civilization and Age of Empires, 
uh, in in classes, uh, history classes or uh, language classes, and specifically for James Foji, he is a linguist. Um, so he has uh, this uh, uh, theoretical framework around affinity spaces and how we think and how we um, uh, how we understand uh, different symbols through language. Um, now I will. Uh, play the second video that is dedicated to this war of mine. I will remind you that this game and the studio behind it, 11-bit um, studios, were uh, part of the Media Ed Forum at the beginning of this year. So here is the video. Wykorzystanie gry komputerowej na zajęcia tak naprawdę był inspirowany moim doświadczeniem bycia z uczniami. Oni do zajęć lekcyjnych wnosili bardzo często opowieści o grach. Zdecydowałam się na The Sword of Mine, ponieważ zaproponował ją, o ile dobrze pamiętam, premier, jako grę, którą można by wpisać na listę lektur uzupełniających. To nie jest strzelanka, to jest historia grupy cywilów w oblężonym mieście, którzy y, muszą sobie radzić. Znaczy, moi uczniowie nauczyli się na tych zajęciach konfrontować różną perspektywę. Oni na przykład zastanawiali się nad tym, co to znaczy wygrać. Co to znaczy wygrać? Czy wygrać to znaczy przetrwać, ale czy każde przetrwanie ma, y, ma sens? No, pracę z tą grą podzieliliśmy sobie na trzy etapy, to znaczy najpierw było granie, później była refleksja pisemna, krótka, ponieważ oni w czasie grania robili notatki, a dopiero później z tymi notatkami spotykaliśmy się na zajęciach. Uczniowie byli zadowoleni grając w tę grę i oni byli moimi fantastycznymi przewodnikami w tym świecie. E, mogli mi pokazać, jak działa mechanika gry, mogli mi ją wytłumaczyć, i ja mogłam się od nich czegoś nauczyć. To było dla nich bardzo, bardzo ciekawe, bardzo ważne doświadczenie. Wprowadzenie gry komputerowej na zajęcia dało mi, daje możliwość zobaczenia inaczej ucznia. Gra komputerowa jest naturalnym, naturalną przestrzenią życia naszych uczniów. A warto wykorzystywać to, co dla uczniów jest naturalne, żywe i autentyczne, żeby nawiązywać z nim relacje. Um, as it is said here at the end, uh, it was already included, this video game, it was included in the curriculum in the Polish schools. As much as I remember, this teacher is, uh, she has a PhD and she is teacher in philosophy. She is not playing the game herself. Uh, so these are very important uh, uh, considerations concerning how we could introduce a video game without having the knowledge of it, without exploring all parts, all the elements of it, and allowing the students to be, to lead in that, uh, and creating a safe space to share their experiences. Um, it was added to the list, uh, uh, reading list after the, uh, the beginning of the uh, Russian Ukraine, in, um, Russian war in Ukraine, uh, and it was, uh, it was uh, released for free for a, a long time uh, with, um, and then it was released with all the, all the proceedings going to Ukraine. Um, and because this is a war game, it is not very direct in the way that people struggle, but it, it is, I played it game and it is, it is very painful at moments. This is not a very good example of uh, how video games create and, um, nourish moral panic, but uh, this is leading us to this part of the conversation about video games. This obstacle in front of video games to be utilized uh, in the classrooms, not the only one, as I mentioned, there are uh, very technological considerations and uh, the competencies of teachers, not possible teachers in all subjects um, to have the time to, to master playing video games. Uh, but what, what are these terms 
what is their um, meaning uh, when we speak about media, interaction with media. It is this persuasive sense, uh, pervasive uh, sense of fear within a community or society that uh, for, for danger, for danger. And this is um, often, um, this danger is endangering uh, young minds, children, most of the time, um, or beliefs or, um, or uh, values. Um, a mass movement based on false and uh, usually exaggerated perception of some cultural behavior of group and people is dangerously deviant and poses a threat to society, values, and interests. Um, <laughs> here are, uh, again, um, I, I, I hope that I'm not uh, um, uh, too scandalous with, with the images that I, I picked up. They are from video games. This one, this video game, uh, GTA 5 was uh, criticized a lot uh, about the influence that it has on um, young people and uh, on, on, uh, as an immoral and with a lot of violence and uh, all the things that are um, put into these uh, rating systems for movies, for example, or for video games. Um, so uh, since the moral panic have uh, occurred in relation to, for example, ritual satanic abuse, uh, it was perceived to be widespread in the 80s and pedophilia, which led to uh, vigilant action against innocent people. This is an example. Another example is about uh, uh, the, the lyrics of, uh, of uh, songs um, or um, again, uh, in, in uh, specific video games. And here is an example, um, not to speak like that. Here is an example, um, not only uh, of the potential of video games to impact in a bad way, uh, the youth behavior, but also fears about uh, the ease of access, for example, to pornography, or uh, ongoing concerns about data collection and worries about addiction. And I chose these examples to prove that many, in many ways, moral panic is, uh, uh, has its, its, um, um, uh, has its um, arguments because these are things that we need to worry about. All these things are things that we need to worry about. Um, with these covers of time, you can just, uh, 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 on a fast line experience, uh, uh, the presence of moral panic in, in media related to content. That is a song and a video that I won't play now. Probably uh, I had my concerns and I, I don't have the time. It is uh, by the, uh, this is Tenacious D from uh, with Jeff Black, uh, one of uh, his uh, his, uh, and it it is dedicated to a game called uh, Red Dead Redemption. Two, uh, a disclaimer is that I this is the game that I played most in the last two years, um, and um, it is probably one of the most immersive and technically and in design on design level. <clears throat> from design perspective, one of the masterpieces that the same studio that created GTA developed. Um, this is uh, just a screenshot from today about uh, video games and moral panic. We all know what is the first association we, we have uh, with young people playing video games. It is strongly related to all, all the um, events of mass shootings, for example, there was a game uh, on Steam that was not green-lighted video game because everyone can um, apply for uh, having uh, their game on Steam. They tried to put a game on uh, mass shootings in classroom playing in the, the role of mass shooter. So these are uh, real, these are real problems that um, even if you're an admirer and a huge fan of video games, they need to be discussed and they need to be, uh, sorry, not that direction, um, to, to be um, acknowledged. Other examples <laughs> from the very uh, early ages of uh, commercial consoles, this is uh, on the left is Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter, and uh, uh, this is uh, um, Counter-Strike on the, on the bottom left, and <laughs> even, even a game with worms, that is called our Worms Armageddon, that is very, very violent. <laughs> um, it is, they are very entertaining. Uh, most people play them because of the entertaining side. Uh, it is uh, challenging to defend games like that. But at the same time, there are a lot of uh, studies, a lot of research on how 
in fact, playing aggressive games with a lot of aggression um, are helpful to just release some of the pressure, release some of the aggression uh, you have uh, in you. Um, this is a screenshot from another very successful commercial video game and very um, um, contradicting one uh, that is Far Cry 5 by, by UNESCO. Um, it is a post-apocalyptic game that I would say, I would dare to say that uh, it is proper appropriate for uh, probably late years at high school uh, to be uh, to be discussed, at least discussed uh, in the classroom. And because I, I uh, there is this tendency to speak about moral panic if you are um, uh, advocate for using video games uh, from such a perspective that uh, this is something that we have to, that it, that it could be neglected. It is not, it is not. Uh, the problems with moral blindness or the problems with other uh, or this uh, insensibility because of the interaction and because of the experience that you have in video games are very, very relevant. Uh, and here is uh, uh, a book by Simon Bauman, Leonidas Donkeys, uh, and this term of a euphora that implies an attitude of indifference to what is happening in the world, a moral numbness. So. Um, I think that every time we talk about moral panic and uh, advocating that media literacy is not only uh, a shield, it's not only from per the perspective of protection uh, to uh, media literacy, we, we have to acknowledge the importance of um, all the effects that uh, media experience could have on, on people. And as we know in, in media literacy, um, main uh, theory and uh, conceptions, uh, everyone has experienced one piece of media in a, in a different way. Uh, for, uh, for someone, for example, who is uh, living in, in, in a war-torn country, is one experience to play this war of mine, for us is another experience. Uh, and this is bringing us to the question about, uh, after all these uh, controversies, <laughs> What is game-based learning? Why it is uh, uh, a way of teaching, a way of learning, uh, both informal and informal environment that, that has its merits and it needs to be uh, considered. Um, it is because uh, it is an approach that integrates, uh, that, 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 that enhances the engagement and motivation. And this is by itself, I would say, these days very important result if you uh, just uh, boost the engagement and motivation of students. Um, it is also, uh, as I said, active learning because the playing, playing games is a very active uh, experience and it creates immediate feedback. Uh, it develops a problem solving and critical thinking skills because again, you can replay one specific situation, you fail. You fail. And Samuel Beckett says, you ever tried, ever failed, you fail. Uh, ever tried, ever failed. No matter. Try again, fail again, fail better. So uh, with video games, this trial error uh, nature of, of, uh, of gaming is very, very important. It is allowing you in the real life, this is, I would say, never possible to be allowed to do mistakes and to fine tune uh, your um, strategy. To, to shift your strategy, to change your strategy, to find a way to solve the problem. Uh, and it is very adaptable in different, different learning styles. And you have all these genres of video games and all these different platforms to play them on. Uh, and what is probably the, the uh, most important merit I would um, highlight uh, in this uh, conversation is that it intersects with media literacy education per se. Uh, because of the critical thinking about media messages in games, again, all these symbols and cultural references, it is understanding digital citizenship through gameplay. You have many uh, platforms allowing you to chat, to have a voice chat, or you become uh, um, a member of uh, fandom, or you start uh, creating content for uh, fandom, or you share your uh, streams on Twitch or YouTube, and this creates at the very beginning, it creates a community space, uh, um, a communication space. Uh, and at the same time, it boosts skills for uh, 
searching and evaluating information because especially with difficult games, most of the gamers rely on the experience of those before them, <laughs> for example, or because you become super interesting in uh, specific events or uh, the studio behind it or uh, the technology or the engine, everything, everything could create curiosity um, uh, when you're playing video games. And uh, again, online safety and privacy awareness, uh, because many players, and especially young ones, experience a lot of negative effects on this easiness of access, um, um, including harassment or um, uh, being uh, scammed to share um, their data, their accounts. So these are uh, things that uh, happen to all, most of the, the young children. That is why they need the supervision of parents and the guidance of teachers. And uh, going to the end of, uh, of this presentation, uh, here are a few examples how moral panic and techno panic could be um, ex uh, explored and weaponized. Uh, especially uh, from because when when uh, this whole industry and um, uh, all the um, all the values or the freedom to experience different realms and to look for your identity beyond your uh, society, your societal bubbles, uh, how they uh, are uh, suppressed by different regimes on a political uh, ground. Uh, for example, and here there is a, something like uh, a debunking to uh, the news that were um, distributed widely. This is BBC that uh, Microsoft uh, was banned in, in Turkey. It was not telling the whole story and there is an official response to that. Uh, but some of the arguments are very interesting to read uh, and they are challenging for to you if you are a proponent of video games and uh, you are um, exposing the moral panic behind many of the reactions it is difficult to answer to answer uh, some of these um, uh, worries um, another video game um, that is uh, not very, very popular, but it is, uh, this is a DLC, so it is, it was additional mode that was added to the original game plugins. The original was, uh, is about simulation of uh, virus distribution, global uh, pandemic, uh, and what are um, the necessary um, um, requirements to allow the circumstance to allow the, the pandemic. Uh, and this one is, uh, this mode is um, dedicated to fake news. Um, so um, it is something that could be, uh, again, it is very difficult game, I would say it needs a lot of practice, but it's uh, relevant to uh, the, the way that media literacy is narrowed down for this information and news literacy. And of course, this game was uh, banned <laughs> because of that. It was banned in this case in China. Uh, you can find it uh, to the uh, title in, in BBC. Uh, um, so you can check the story behind it. And speaking about the political uh, dimension of many of the video games and all these references in video games, many of them are very subtle and some of them are way more visible. This is a game that is not released officially. This is Star Citizen. This is uh, a phenomena in the game industry because it was kickstart, kickstarted with um, uh, probably one or two million dollars and it uh, attracted uh, more than one uh, half a billion dollars uh, in its alpha stage. Uh, many uh, of the conversation, as I said, when you start playing the video game, it it drives your curiosity. You start asking questions, and you know, media literacy is an inquiry based uh, skill set and competence. And these questions brings you to different community spaces. In this case, this is uh, Reddit. Reddit uh, has a lot of subreddits that are dedicated to different uh, titles. And a lot of discussions are provoking people to look for context, to look for the cultural context of the people who designed, who developed this game. Um, and something that is, as 
uh, ending ending this uh, this uh, narrative uh, too too long uh, monologue uh, is about uh, the core of the video games that is the story and the truth is that we love stories we love to tell stories we love to listen to stories and to experience them and myths specifically uh, are stories which offer explanation and acceptance of the inexplicable and unacceptable uh, and that was this way from the very beginning of uh, human civilization. And this is very present now, and this is part of the problem with us falling to untrue and misleading information. Uh, from then on, um, speaking about this dimension of identity that you, you playing a lot of video games, you uh, become one in many ways you, with your character or with your environment and we become what we believe in. So again, what is instilled in, in the stories is very, very important. We have to be conscious. So playing video games and learning to be conscious about these beliefs and values that are instilled in us is very important. Um, and what we believe is in is the function of our bringing and schooling and closest environment um, and social interactions and experience, it's not only video games, it is much way complex. And what we believe, in, believe in is materialized through depictions and slogans and biases. So uh, we could learn a lot about our own biases through video games and how we experience uh, different characters and the challenges. Uh, this is a resource page, you will have it in the presentation about, uh, this is a, a series by Crash Course. Uh, which I find very engaging uh, by itself, uh, even if not playing games uh, with your students, if you're teaching, uh, to watch and to discuss everything that is in this series um, about uh, video games is, uh, I would say, um, a huge um, knowledge curve uh, uh, by itself. Uh, and uh, as I promised a few serious games. So these are games that were developed to be educational. M most of them has a curriculum around them. Uh, one example is Harmony Square. Another one uh, is iReporter by B B BBC and um, uh, informal, uh, probably, you know, news literacy project. This game was developed uh, and released uh, for mobile. These are mobile or browser-based games. They're all free. Uh, with a lot of resources and some uh, research behind them. So uh, with that, I uh, uh, put the dot here of, uh, of the story about video games uh, and uh, moral panic and hope that we'll have uh, a prolific discussion. Oh my God, the chat is full with messages. <laughs> I, um, I now uh, We'll uh, ask uh, Jenna if we go straight to breakout rooms or uh, discuss some of these questions or uh, how to proceed. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you so much, Aglika. I think we're going to have a very brief breakout session. I've just dropped three questions in the chat. Thank they you. are, have you ever experienced moral and or tech panic? Have you ever encountered moral panic reactions in your media literacy education activities? Or what surprised and provoked you most in the course of this presentation? Um, we're going to send you off in groups just to talk for five minutes. We'll come back. I'll ask a few of you to share what you talked about and then we'll have time for some questions and that'll be it. Just give us a minute as we're, we're sorting you all. Oh, I missed my chance to thank Salome. She wrote that she needs to leave. But um... right, no worries. If anybody has any questions that you'd like to ask before you head out, feel free to leave them in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask them out loud. Right. And if not, um, we do have enough people to just have our discussion here. If any of you would like to share about your experiences with moral panic or tech panic, with anything you heard in the presentation, any thoughts you might have had, we'd love to hear them, even if you just type them in the chat. Thanks. I mean, obviously, we were moving kind of quick and we're all getting just to know each other. But um, we talked about, you know, what's the latest, you know, of 
more on tech panic and I added to the chat um, something a video clip that I use from retro report about the satanic panic that took place in you know the age of Dungeons and Dragons and um, in particular I, I run into this a lot as I do game development with my students so we make video games and some of them are 3D and they work with virtual and augmented reality and we get a lot of pushback because the biggest things kids want to create are the battle royale style games and um, who wants, you know, to be the, the teacher who's, you know, promoting guns in, in a school in the United States. So I said, well, you know, we can shift that around. I've used dodgeball as kind of the alternative, but there's definitely a lot of pushback um, that comes from people not fully understanding, um, you know, that, that this is just like every generation has gone through, that there's going to be something that is deemed as immoral or provoking um you know violence or uh, abuse and things that we we just don't have the research that supports that that is the case that in fact you know it often opens up opportunities for collaboration um and not only uh, creative outlets but also an opportunity to be a little more empathetic so exactly Thank you, Mark, so much. And thank you all for the comments in the chat and the examples and the titles and everything. Uh, uh, one more, probably. Do we have a time for two? <laughs> but at least one more. <laughs> so in, in our group, um, Joseph brought up this really interesting idea, which is that there are thousands and thousands of games on the market, that it's totally overwhelming. And how, how do we work with them? And and if I combine that with what Mark was just saying, um, what occurred to me is that there's a, some kind of a cognitive layer between the overt content of a game and the game mechanics in which kids learn or intuit some set of principles that enables them to move really, really easily from one game to another or even from one space to another, like the space between, I think Joseph mentioned, um, uh, Roblox and Grand Theft Auto or something like that, right? Like, like kids learn something that enables them to move pretty seamlessly from one to another and enables them to discern what the differences are in the new game and how to navigate that new game. And I kind of feel like that's something that's understudied. I don't know anybody who's actually talked about that. I mean, my, my disciplinary background is in um, cognitive development and learning. And, and I'm not aware of anybody who's really looked into video games as a skill set, digital games altogether as a skill set that kids develop. There is a European neuroscientist, and if you if you contact me, I will bring it to you. The uh, the the research of this neuroscientist, I forgot the name. I'm sorry about it. I was thinking about putting it in the presentation, um, but it is uh, the skills and how long they are. You keep the skills that you you train, you learn from, and uh, how they are relevant, even if more instrumental skills like um, reactions or something like that, they are, uh, has their um, uh, important part in in real life. Uh, and they are correlated with uh, mental <laughs> and cognitive skills as well, not only uh, with this. So I will I will share with you that uh, definitely. And, and I just wonder if that if if understanding those might be a way to get to the distinction that Mark was talking about, like to be able to talk about games and and get people not to pay attention to the, you know, overt disturbing cultural content, but to the actual experience and, and what can be from it good questions oh my god thank you thank you so much uh for these questions um jenna it is up to you to yeah well we have about three minutes left if you'd like to to take those you're more than welcome to if anybody else has questions you're more than welcome to drop them in the chat we will try and get to them uh i'm just writing my email you have the slides and the email is at the end of the slides as well. Uh, so I will be more than thankful if you share more than uh, about your impressions and experience with, uh, on, on video games in general and, and um, the way that we framed the conversation today. Mm -hmm. so, uh, Absolutely. Right. Well, if, if that is all the questions that we have, 
then I'm going to thank you very much for, for coming to this and for staying to the very end. Uh, the recording for this session and the slides is going to be available on the Media Education Lab website, the same place where you registered for this. Um, I believe that Glika also dropped the, the slides earlier in the chat, so there's a link directly to that. Um, if this series interests you, we have another webinar next Monday. So in less than a week, it's called Transforming Schools with Media Education. It's about real curriculum that's been implemented uh, internationally to move past kind of simple workshops and how to actually implement toolkits in a practical way. Um, it's going to be a great time. It's still free. Uh, and I hope to see you all back for that. Thank you very much to Aglika for all of your work and for speaking to all of us for free. We really appreciate it. It was an honor and I hope to see you next month for this webinar because I can wait for it uh, as well. So thank you, thank you, thank you.